All right, our first speaker for the afternoon session is going to be Lori Ziegelmeyer. She's coming from McAllister College, and she's going to talk to us today about some really nice work on analyzing collective motion with uh, machine learning and topological data analysis. So I'll turn it over to you, Lori. Great. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Mason, and all of you uh, who are uh, attending this talk virtually. Um, so to get started, uh, I want to motivate this uh, with uh, applications of biological aggregations. So biological aggregations are groups of organisms such as fish schools or bird flocks or insect swarms, mammal herds, uh, that uh, are made up of individual organisms or, or agents or particles uh, that uh, each individually move, but together might uh, create some collective motion. Now, these individual organisms, they might sense one another uh, via sight or sound or touch or any of the senses. And um, the senses might encourage them to repel from one another, or they might attract to one another, um, uh, or they might decide to align with each other. But the idea is that um, uh, these individual particles might together form some collective motion. And our goal is to understand uh, the behavior of this collective motion uh, through a variety of lenses. Now, if we think of these individual point particles, uh, they might, um, there might be dozens or hundreds or thousands of individual particles. They each have velocities associated to them. And then these positions and velocities are going to be changing over time. And so this is a lot of data. And what we would want to do is understand how we could actually analyze that data. So a classic way to analyze uh, these biological aggregations is to form some um, uh, order parameter, uh, maybe derived from physics. So for instance, uh, an alignment order parameter would uh, say add up all the uh, velocities and then um, uh, normalize uh, by these velocities. So imagine we have uh, these individual particles here, uh, uh, each with a position and the little uh, bar denotes uh, their velocity. And over time, we might, or at this given point, we might say, well, are these particles aligned or are they not? And this alignment order parameter can give a snapshot um, at this moment in time, uh, whether uh, these particles are behaving a certain way. Now, this order parameter tells us something, but uh, it doesn't tell us the full story. So uh, for instance, uh, if we looked at uh, these particles, we see they are all moving in the same direction. So the alignment order parameter would be one. However, um, uh, these uh, particles here, uh, even though we might say they're highly aligned uh, just in two separate groups, uh, the alignment order parameter is zero. So the alignment order parameter could lead us astray. Now this is for a static uh, moment in time. And uh, what we might want to do is create a time series of the alignment order parameter uh, and see over time uh, what happens to a given set of uh, data. And so uh, if uh, this was the time series that resulted, we could see that the particles are not aligned at early times and over a period of time, they do appear to align. So um, uh, that's one method of, uh, uh, analyzing this large amount of data. Another method is with topological data analysis. And um, I know we've uh, had some morning sessions here, but uh, we might have uh, more participants joining us now. Um, and uh, also, uh, if people are joining just for the online session, uh, we can consider um, a quick overview of topological data analysis. So uh, there's lots of different pipelines that you can use for TDA. And um, uh, we saw in the morning, we could see things like extended persistence or sublevel or super level set persistence. Uh, the type of persistence that I'm going to focus on is um, uh, point cloud data. So uh, we want to envision our data as a point cloud. So for instance, it could be just the position data of um, your um, uh, objects, or it could be position velocity data. And for now, we're going to focus on just one uh, snapshot in time. And then from these data, we need to get some notion of similarity, so measure some sort of distance. And what we do is we can build a simplicial complex between proximate points. 
So um, a simplicial complex is a topological object um, uh, that can uh, measure uh, connections between data. And there's a variety of ways to do this. Most commonly, people use something called the Viatora Scripps complex when they're analyzing data. Now, once we have a simplicial complex, uh, we can determine the topology of it by uh, computing something called homology, which roughly is going to count um, the number of holes of different dimensions. And what we're going to do is actually um, uh, vary the proximity parameter that we use to build our simplicial complex across different scales. And this is something called persistent homology. Okay, and so sort of a classic picture is we begin with uh, some data. We think of growing uh, some epsilon balls. Whenever two points are pairwise with an epsilon, we uh, create a edge between them. Whenever three points are uh, pairwise with an epsilon, we create a triangle and then higher dimensional um, uh, geometric objects can be formed as well. And what we do is we track the different um, topological features. So some topological features are the number of connected components. So um, at uh, this early um, moment in the proximity scale, um, uh, we see that we have uh, just seven isolated points. At this later proximity scale, uh, we would have six uh, uh, connected components because um, uh, these two have merged. At this later time, we only have two connected components and we also notice another topological feature in this hole that has uh, formed here. So this can be encoded in something called a barcode. And the way to read a barcode is uh, we have our proximity scale along uh, the x-axis here. So as we're growing these epsilon balls, uh, our simplicial complexes are going to uh, change. And what we're going to do is track how uh, these change. So uh, the idea is that early scales, we have a distinct bar for each of the topological features uh, corresponding to connected components. Uh, connections merge and uh, we lose some of these features and then we're left with uh, two connected components until finally um, everything will connect into a single component. There's a distinct barcode for each um, uh, type of hole you're counting. So Betty zero um, is uh, the number of features of connected components. Betty one is uh, the number of topological loops and so on. Now the process for doing so, uh, this works great if we have a static uh, point cloud of data. We can count our number of topological features at various proximity scales. And uh, then this gives us some information about our structure. But um, if we were to take this data, we could uh, think about um, uh, sort of losing some information from the barcode and just keeping track of uh, this data on, say, a grid. This is something called a Betty curve, which we saw earlier this morning. So, um, uh, this is the traditional pipeline, but what happens if we have um, uh, a set of data that's moving in time. So um, uh, we would like to measure the topology as time evolves. Well, we can just take that vertical um, uh, Betty curve and do this at each time step. And what we get is um, uh, a, con or a, a function of two variables, our proximity parameter and our simulation time. And uh, we can see uh, that uh, this matrix is going to record uh, the topological information over both scale and time. We can visualize this uh, two-dimensional uh, function as a contour plot. Um, and we have this really clumsy acronym here, Contour Realization of Computed K-Dimensional Whole Evolution in the RIPS Complex. It's a mouthful. Um, basically, so we can just say that it's a Crocker plot to display Betty numbers, but you can never say those things together. So uh, this is joint work with um, collaborators Chad Topaz and Tom Halverson, and it came out in um, a 2015 uh, PLOS One paper. Okay, so you can think of this as a matrix or as something uh, useful to analyze your uh, data uh, over both time and scale. So Crockers are actually great um, for exploring your data. So um, for this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, one particular dynamical system model, uh, the Dorsonia model. Um, uh, it's a very seminal model, which uh, has been cited over 500 times uh, in the literature. 
Um, and uh, it uh, describes a motion of individual uh, interacting point uh, particles uh, in an unbounded plane in continuous time. So if we have indistinct particles, and uh, we can see that each individual particle will follow uh, these ordinary differential equations, where the first differential equation says the time derivative of position x is our velocity v. Okay? The second equation is um, uh, Newton's law. So it says mass times acceleration is a sum of forces, where uh, these three uh, different forces are an, um, uh, self-propulsion force, a friction force, and then there's a social interaction force. And the social interaction force can be um, uh, written in terms of this Mor Mor Morse type potential, okay, where we have a re uh, repulsion uh, term and we have an attraction term. So the way to understand this is that um, uh, for a given particle, as the distance uh, progresses away from this, uh, we can see uh, that the repulsion is going to decay uh, in space, and uh, we're going to have both a uh, parameter of um, repulsion strength, uh, which is denoted as CR, and repulsion length, which is denoted as LR. Okay. Similarly, we'll have attraction. Uh, we see these are signed oppositely, so we'll have an attraction strength and an attraction um, length scale. So the way to think about this is um, uh, perhaps over really small scales, if individual particles are really close to one another, they want their personal space or their social distance. And so they're going to um, uh, repel away from uh, each other for um, uh, some length scale. Okay. Once they're beyond uh, some length scale, maybe they want to come closer together and attract to one another. And so uh, that would be a length scale of attraction. Now these um, uh, equations can be uh, non-dimensionalized and uh, we are left with uh, four parameters essentially. So our self-propulsion, our uh, friction, and then the ratios of the um, repulsion attraction um, uh, strength and the length scales ratio. Okay, so this Dorsarnia model is um, really interesting because it uh, exhibits interesting paradigmatic um, uh, behaviors. And uh, this is what we're going to explore in our analysis uh, today. So here is one particular parameter uh, set, and uh, we see that we have snapshots of an early time, a middle time, and a late time. And what we have here is individual particles that are essentially just um, randomly distributed and uh, they have random velocities at early time. And over time, um, we see that some structure begins to emerge. And this is, the structure is called a double mill, where we see that we have uh, some particles uh, rotating clockwise, and then we have a minority of particles moving counterclockwise. Okay, and then as time progresses, that becomes even more pronounced. So what we uh, want to do is actually use um, uh, order parameters and topology to understand uh, that particular uh, simulation from the Dorsonia model. And so uh, the order parameters that are commonly used uh, for this model is polarization. So um, uh, think of polarization as uh, similar to alignment. Uh, so are the particles moving in the same direction? If they are, then that would be a high polarization, if they're not, um, uh, or they're moving in opposite directions, that would result in low polarization. Okay, the other, um, another order parameter is angular momentum. And so what does this say? It says, are the particles rotating? And in particular, are they rotating in the same direction? So uh, these particles would all be rotating clockwise, uh, so we would have high angular momentum here. Whereas in this instance, uh, it's only medium um, angular momentum because the particles, yes, are moving in a circle, but some are moving in the opposite direction. And then uh, this uh, would also be low angular momentum because no, they're not moving in a circle. Now, uh, there's also something called absolute angular momentum where we take the absolute value of the numerator. And this is just are the particles rotating? We don't care uh, which direction they're rotating. Are they just uh, rotating um, at all? 
And then finally, uh, we have average distance to nearest neighbor. Um, and so if the particles are spread out, this would uh, be high. If they're uh, clumped together, this would be low. Okay, so what we've done is taken that particular snapshot of uh, the uh, Dorsonia um, or simulation and uh, analyzed it with order parameters and with topology. So uh, there's a lot on this slide, so I'll go through and um, describe it carefully. So uh, the key thing is um, here we have our polarization in red and these particles don't align. So the polarization is uh, small for the duration of the simulation. Um, our uh, angular momentum we see over time uh, goes quite uh, high, but if we notice that it's not actually one, and that's because there's a minority of particles that are moving the opposite direction. And so absolute angular momentum um, can actually capture that um, uh, all of the particles are uh, moving in a circle. And because there's a difference between absolute angular momentum and um, uh, angular momentum, we can see that uh, there is this double null structure. Now, I will say these order parameters are often uh, derived after seeing some collective behavior and then wanting to find some way to measure it. In contrast, uh, in topology, um, uh, we just take the structure of the data and we don't uh, actually uh, look at um, or we don't uh, use a priori information about the data to uh, define our measure. So here, this is our dimension zero Crocker plot, so measuring uh, connected components, and this is our dimension one uh, Crocker plot, plot um, uh, comparing um, topological circles. Okay, so the way to read this is above some proximity scale, we have only one connected component, Below in this region, uh, there are uh, lots of connected components which we uh, interpret as noise. And over time, we see this quite jaggedy contour plot. So uh, there's a periodic or um, sporadic coagulation and fragmentation of um, uh, features. So in our uh, dimension one Crocker plot, we see uh, some actually interesting structure emerge. So after about maybe simulation time 20, we see some um, structure emerging here. And uh, what these correspond to is two topological circles in this region and one topological circle in this region. And notice that these persist both in simulation time and uh, proximity scale. And so uh, I claim that this actually reveals that we have a double mill structure because uh, these data are position velocity data um, uh, that are in four dimensional space and we would actually have uh, our, our circle going one way and our circle going the other way corresponding um, to the two circles. Now they merge um, at the scale of our um, uh, radius of uh, this uh, double mill and I claim that uh, points one and three are actually closer together in this four dimensional space than two and three. Okay, so uh, how are we going to use this uh, to do um, some parameter identification? So this is our main goal. So uh, commonly um, uh, there is a forward problem of we assign some parameters, feed them into some sort of agent based model, and then we uh, get out our collective behavior. But in this project, we're actually going to do more of an inverse problem. So uh, given some collective behavior, can we use some uh, feature vector uh, that we can feed into machine learning algorithms uh, to infer individual parameters and also understand um, uh, what types of behaviors we're seeing? So our goal is to say, so what is an informative way to summarize this collective behavior for these various machine learning techniques, okay? Now, um, as I mentioned, the Dorsonia model has a variety of really interesting patterns. So if we uh, vary C and L, uh, the ratios of the strength and um, length scales here, we can get structures such as a single mill, a double mill, a double ring, collective swarm, and escape. So a single mill, all the particles are going in one direction, double mill, some, most particles are going in one direction, a few might be going the other, double ring, they're all slightly or closely um, aligned to a circle, uh, a collective swarm. Uh, they are essentially really close together and they might be rotating um, 
uh, in some direction. And then uh, there's an escape. So the particles essentially just go off into space. Uh, and there's various types of escapes as I've um, uh, included in um, uh, this bottom right image. Now, uh, uh, there are these seven phenotypes associated to various parameters. And we chose 25 different parameter sets, uh, five each uh, for uh, C and L. Okay, so our pipeline is that um, uh, what we do is we take each of these 25 parameter sets and we get 100 realizations where we've changed our initial uh, conditions for our, our position and velocity. And then what we do is take these simulations and feed them into either order parameters, so we get a time series of the order parameters, or we feed it into topology and we get um, these uh, Crocker matrices. Um, uh, from each of these, we can get a vector, uh, and these vectors uh, can be fed into machine learning algorithms where we would hope to predict parameters and patterns. So uh, here's just a few of the different phenotypes. Um, uh, maybe we'll focus on, say, the double ring. Um, and in this plot, we see our order parameters and then our Betty 0 and Betty 1 Crocker plots. And so uh, just a couple of things to point out. Uh, we see that our um, polarization uh, is essentially uh, quite low because these particles don't align. Our angular momentum is high, but not as high as our uh, absolute angular momentum because some particles are moving counter to the um, majority. And then um, we see that our particles are fairly close. Now, um, we also have uh, our dimension zero uh, Crocker plot. So uh, over time, uh, things get really connected um, together at some scale. And then also um, we see our two topological circles that persist um, uh, both for a large amount of scale and time. Now, once we have these feature vectors, we can feed them into machine learning algorithms. And we use two approaches. One uh, is an unsupervised approach, k-metroids, and then uh, another supervised approach, support vector machines. Okay, so in k-metroids, uh, we uh, defined a k equals 25 um, clusters, uh, because we had 25 different parameters uh, where each of the meteoroid is going to minimize the sum of the pairwise distances. And then we assess accuracy based on um, is a simulation that's assigned to a cluster of a particular meteoroid, does it actually have uh, the correct parameter or phenotype? We also did support vector machines where uh, we use uh, some of our training data to um, find hyperplanes that divide uh, simulations according to parameters. And we did a five-fold cross-validation where we exclude uh, some of our um, uh, test data and then uh, our accuracy is based on uh, any simulation that's excluded, or that is our um, out-of-sample simulations over um, the total number of out-of-sample simulations, okay? When we did the unsupervised classification, uh, we got the following results. So let's focus first on parameter accuracy. And uh, we see that this is um, a quite difficult problem. So uh, we consider the time series or um, the um, uh, concatenation of all of these. And we see the values are quite low, whereas with TDA, uh, they're a bit higher. I'll mention um, we used time delayed position instead of uh, incorporating velocity in our uh, TDA data. Now it turns out when um, you uh, just look at phenotypes, uh, the problem becomes much easier. And this is uh, more easily understood uh, by looking at uh, confusion matrices of our order parameters and our position um, uh, crockers and our time delayed crockers. And so, the uh, red boxes uh, indicate different phenotypes, and um, we see that even if uh, things are misclassified versus all of the different parameters, they roughly uh, fall um, within the same um, phenotype. Okay, and it seems that single mills and uh, collective swarming are the most difficult for um, uh, the order parameters, whereas uh, only the collective swarming is uh, pretty difficult for the crockers. 
SVM, we see the accuracy is um, improved. So this is a, a supervised learning um, or classification problem. And so we see that our accuracy is um, greatly improved. Now, um, one thing I should mention is that uh, the dimension of uh, these time series and these crackers are uh, greatly uh, different. Um, and so you might say this is not really a fair comparison. So what we did is we used PCA to actually uh, reduce the dimension of our uh, feature vectors from, um, so 87 in the case of uh, the order parameters, uh, down to three. And then we also did the same for uh, the uh, crockers, the topological information. And you'll see that even um, reduced to 87 dimensional, uh, we um, uh, have a higher accuracy with uh, the uh, TDA than with the order parameters. And interestingly, in the low dimensional limit of dimension, we um, uh, still have quite high accuracy. And then um, just you can visualize these results in um, a plot such as this, which uh, has the individual simulations. And we see that um, uh, we really have very few simulations that are misclassified. So in conclusion, uh, crockers are a way to um, uh, understand topological properties of time varying systems. And they can be combined with machine learning and statistical tools. And, um, they can identify global behaviors, parameter identification, or uh, we've also done a paper uh, where they can be used for model selection. Okay, and I just want to thank my wonderful collaborators. Uh, so uh, I mentioned uh, Tom and Chad. Uh, the bulk of this talk was um, uh, work that I did with a group of wonderful researchers uh, through a mathematics research community. So if you don't know of these, I encourage you to look into these MRCs, they're great opportunities. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. All right, Let, uh, if you have questions, I know some people have joined us since I last made this announcement. So if you have questions, uh, please send them in the chat to either Mason or myself and we can call on you so you can ask your question to Lori. Yeah, um, so Corey Brown is pinging me to say he has a question. So why don't you unmute yourself and ask that? Hi, uh, great talk. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the last talk, I'm pretty new to topological data analysis. Uh, I actually saw Chad give a talk at Siam Dynamical Systems at Snowbird. It was a wonderful talk. Um, but um, I, I do, I work in the Koopman uh, data-driven dynamical systems realm, and I'm interested in this intersection with time-varying network analysis and this collective, uh, collective uh, motion behavioral analysis is um, a nice application. Um, so um, what was I gonna mention? Uh, what I think might be nice with these uh, uh, topological characterizations is um, for time varying data like this is it might provide a nice constraint for data driven dynamical systems people in terms of what sort of um, properties an invariant manifold uh, swarm might be moving on or something like that um, might help uh, con constraining dynamical characterizations or uh, vice versa. So it'd be interesting to find some um, um, intersections in these domains. I don't know if you have any comments, but there wasn't really a question of this. <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds uh, certainly interesting. And um, I should mention that uh, Crocker plots are just one um, tool uh, that can use topology um, to analyze time varying system. It's a nice, really simple tool. Uh, there's some other um, uh, more complex tools uh, by like Wu Jim Kim and then uh, Corcoran and collaborators also have uh, something uh, that uses zigzag persistence and persistence landscapes. So uh, there's lots of interesting topology tools out there um, uh, to analyze these sorts of data. Thanks. I have a few questions in my chat. The first one's from Ambrose. So maybe Ambrose can go ahead and unmute and ask his question. Um, hi, Lori. Um, thanks for a fantastic talk and these are um, very interesting results. Um, I, 
uh, just want to um, go to slide 20. I think uh, it's one of the uh, tables of um, results. And um, uh, I seem to notice that um, you know, uh, for some cases that uh, for parameter accuracy, having the Betty ones, uh, uh, including Betty ones and Betty zeros, doesn't seem to improve the accuracy uh, as much uh, as you, know, you see in the phenotype accuracy. Um, do you have any intuition why that is the case? Yeah, we thought a little bit about this, and I think, you know, these are very high dimensional features. Um, uh, so what, in the next slide, I show the dimension. So 200 by um, 86 uh, dimensional features. And so the way I can think of this is it's a high dimensional feature that's not contributing that much. So it um, actually uh, allows for more confusion in the classifier than um, uh, the added benefit is. Uh, essentially what uh, uh, I would uh, guess is happening here. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have one last quick question and then I think we'll probably want to get our next speaker set up. Um, this is a question from Wen Wen Lee who asked if I could ask this question by proxy. Um, the question is, is there any place we can apply TDA methods in the machine learning other than labeling the data? Other than labeling the data. So, for instance, this, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Um, so it is true that we uh, do have labeled data um, either for the parameter or the phenotype in this, but uh, k-metroids is an uh, unclassified approach. And of course, um, any machine learning algorithm uh, where we uh, don't have labeled data um, uh, if we have some subset that is labeled and then we get, say, a new sample, we could uh, see where that is classified with the um, already labeled data. I'm not sure if that answers your question. I'd be happy to talk about it more offline. And it looks like we, we might even have some questions we won't have time to get uh, to. get to. So we encourage you to, to reach out to Lori and continue these discussions, because I think there's a lot of really good discussions to be had here. Yes, but, uh, yeah. thank you. So in the interest of time, let's thank Lori again.